Hello, hello, COP. Welcome to our online evening service. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for prioritizing the place that God has in our lives, that he is to be honored, he is to be acknowledged. And what does it say in Psalm 91 that we read every night? I will protect him because he knows my name. That's ESV. NIV 84 says, because he acknowledges my name. When we acknowledge the Lord and put him first, special things happen in our lives. Amen. So as always, with our online services, we start with reading Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen, amen. Thank God for his word. Thank God for the reality of the word in our lives. For our praise moment today, we are going to Psalm 84. And in Psalm 84, we're going to read verse 11. And it says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. But in order to talk about that verse, it starts with the word for or because. Therefore, we are driven back to the verses just before it. So let's read starting in verse 10. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. We are looking at a psalm that was written by one of the ushers, one of the sons of Korah. And we've already looked at verse 10, which actually says it's better. It's better. One moment with God is better than a thousand anythings. <laughs> a thousand anythings. A thousand rants and raves. A thousand counseling sessions. A thousand Facebook posts. A thousand anythings. One moment with God is better, meaning it's more effective, it's more productive, it is better for us, it, it produces more than anything else in our life. And it's better, again, it's my choice, it's better to serve God, it's better to be a doorkeeper than to dwell in the tents of the wicked, it's better to choose serving God rather than to gain the wealth and the corresponding lifestyle of the wicked. Amen. Why? Why is this better? For, because, it is God 
who is a sun and shield. You know, in Malachi 4 verse 2, it talks about the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. It's better if you need healing. It's better to have a moment with God. But you know, you listen to your doctors. You cooperate with your own personal family doctor. You cooperate and you realize that the great physician is working on your behalf. The sun of righteousness rising with healing in his wings. The word sun is the word Shemesh in Hebrew. You know, there's a town in Israel called Beth Shemesh, which means house, Beth, house of the sun, house of sunshine. That's where we live. We live in a house of sun. We live in a place where the Lord God is our sun and shield. And he does not slumber or sleep. He is shining upon us. And the rising of the sun indicates to us a new day, new mercies. His mercies are new, new opportunities. Great things happen in sunlight. And terrible things happen in the darkness. We see in Psalm 91, the things that stalk in darkness that we don't want any part of. Thieves try to break in and destroy at nighttime. In the, when everybody's sleeping, they, that's the time. We also see great things happening because of sunlight. Joshua won a battle when he got a couple extra hours of sunlight due to a miracle of the Lord when the sun went, actually the sundial went, showed it, the sun holding still, going back an hour. We see awesome things happening in sunlight and terrible things happening in darkness. So it's great that it is God who is our sun and shield. It is God. So no wonder it's better to serve the Lord than to have all the wealth of the world, all the wealth of the wicked, than to be anywhere else in our lives. It's better to be found serving the Lord. He is our sun and our shield. That word shield, magen, magen in Hebrew, it is our defense. It is our protection. He is there to be our sunshine and our shield. And it says, he bestows favor. He bestows, that word means to place, to cause to be placed in our lives, to put, to firmly put something in our lives. And you know, when we get blessings from God, we can say, ah, there he goes bestowing again. There he goes bestowing again, putting, placing firmly in our lives his blessings, which cannot be shaken and cannot be removed by people of this world. He bestows favor, favor in Actually, ESV and NIV 84, they both say favor and honor. In the NLT, it says grace and glory. But that's okay. It means the same thing. Favor means grace or kindness. Displaying one's pleasure. If you need favor in your life, in your business, who do you turn to? You miss services because, you know, I just need to work harder. No, you run to God. Better is one moment with the Lord. Why? Because he bestows, he places firmly favor. He puts favor in our lives as believers. Kindness. People will show you kindness, not through any value of your own or any goodness of your own, but just because God has placed it there in your life. And honor, that word honor is, actually it's kabod, it's translated glory. That's why NLT says grace and glory. It also means his glorious presence. He places his glorious presence. And when God is with you, when he is for you, what more could you ever want? What more could you ask than God, his favor, his honor to be upon your life? God bestows 
favor and honor, grace and glory. He is our sun and our shield. Amen. So it's a great thing to be in the presence of the Lord. It's better, better to be a moment with God than a thousand any anywhere else, a thousand of a thousand of anything else. It's better to serve God than to have all the wealth of the world, of the wicked. Let's remember that as we go through our, our days. Let's remember to lift our eyes to the Lord. He bestows favor. And when he blesses you, you tell your family and friends, there he goes bestowing again. There he goes placing favor. There he goes bestowing again. We have a wonderful God. Right now, it's time for us to stand up and worship our wonderful God. So let us rejoice in the blessings of the Lord. Let's rejoice in God, our blesser, right now as we worship him together.
Tonight, as we turn our attention again to 1 Corinthians, we are learning about the concept of wisdom and our role in ministry to only communicate God's wisdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning with verse 6. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, so we see audience determines the content of the message. But not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No. We speak God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man, except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God, except the spirit of God. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit of him who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. Now, last night we saw that all ministry must flow from wisdom, that we don't teach people facts. We are not an educational institution. We are a wisdom institution, and the difference is facts are just information. Knowledge is just information. Wisdom is the application of that information. Wisdom lays down patterns of life, and this is what it means to us, and this is how it means our decisions to change, and this is what it means of how we should live. It, wisdom is the application of knowledge. What does this mean to our lives? So we began to look at the false source of ministry's wisdom, that we, we don't look to the wisdom of this age, and that's where we ended up last night. But now let's pick up from there and begin to understand why we don't look to the world for wisdom, why we don't spend our time in services teaching Warren Buffett, Steve Jobs, uh, Jack Welch, Good to Great, John Gokanway, Henry C., Plato, Socrates, Diogenes, wh why we don't spend our life teaching the wisdom of this world? Because there is a wisdom of this world. I mean, they, they know how to apply things, but why is it that we in the body of Christ do not teach the wisdom of this world? Well, let's start with verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased that through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. So preaching Warren Buffett will never bring people to a knowledge of God. Preaching Socrates, preaching Plato, preaching the art of war will never bring people to a knowledge of God. Now, please look at that carefully. The world through its wisdom did not know him. The world through its wisdom did not know him. And I, and I know all over the world today, it, it's very popular to sing secular music and preach uh, secular books and things in, in church. And I'll never forget when Sister Bev and I were very young, we attended a, a church in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. And we were there one Sunday, and we were really looking forward to being in church that day. And the pastor opened by reading a, a story. I mean, his sermon was a story from the Reader's Digest. And I thought, okay, kind of a long introduction, but this is going to be a good sermon now. And he dismissed in prayer. 
for about 12 minutes, he read a story from the Reader's Digest. Well, you know, nothing against the guy, but the world through its wisdom did not know him. Beloved, the reason we preach the word and the reason we don't preach the wisdom of this world, we don't preach great philosophers, we don't create, preach great business leaders, we don't preach what great intellectuals say, is because the wisdom of this world will never bring people to a knowledge of God. And how can it? Do you remember how I taught you yesterday that the source of this world's wisdom is the God of this age? Ephesians 2, 2, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, the ruler of the kingdom of the air. And who is that ruler of the kingdom of the air? It's Satan. How? And, and Satan does have incredible wisdom. I mean, please, don't, don't you ever forget that. But it's not a wisdom that will bring people to God. Satan hates God. Why would any of his wisdom Bring about the knowledge of God. He wants everybody in this world to look at him. He's the God of this world. He is the most self-centered, selfish, narcissistic creature <laughs> that's ever walked this earth. So nothing that he, none of his wisdom that he gives will ever bring people to a knowledge of God. This is why the true foundation of faith does not rest on man's wisdom. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 5. You can't preach an, a, a sermon of man's wisdom and then give an altar call and expect people's faith to have any, any kind of a foundation. Faith should not rest on man's wisdom. She says, all right, we, we don't speak the wisdom of this age in God's house because people can't get to know God through that. We don't speak the wisdom of the rulers of this age. Now, this takes it even a step deeper. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. Now, rulers here is the Greek word archon. It means the princes, the rulers, the commanders, the chiefs, the kings. This would be governmental. This would be business. This would be financial. This would be philosophical. He said, now listen, these are the great influencers of society. He said, I don't preach the words of the great influencers of society. Paul did not walk around teaching Socrates and Plato. And the one time he did allude to them was in Athens. And after that, he said, no, no, I'm, I'm not going to ever do that again. I determined to know only preach Christ and him crucified. Now, now, beloved, I know it's very popular in this world today for preachers to stand up and quote big name people. Because, forgive me, it makes you think that somehow there's more credibility to your words and to what you are saying because you are quoting somebody who agrees with you or you agree with them and it gives more validity to your words. So you quote a Henry C. or a John Conway or an Ayala or a Socrates or a Plato or a Shinzu's art of, of war. You, you, you quote these things in church and I'm sorry. Paul said very clearly, who are coming to nothing, 1 Corinthians 2, 6. All of these men are coming to nothing. I mean, Jean Conway was really, really kind to us as a church in very dark days of our life. He's very kind to us. And we moved into to, to Robinson's up there at, at the, the shopping mall close by the church now. And we were there for several years. And he was very kind to us in those days. But, you know, one day he dies. One day, Henry C. has died. One day, Ayala will die. One day, Socrates died. One day, Plato died. One day, Warren Buffett will die. One day, Steve Jobs did die. Now, all men die. They come to nothing. The wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. We teach the words of God because he never has an end. God is eternal. What he says will always work. Now, no, no, please forgive me, you need to get a hold of this. No matter how smart a Warren Buffett is, or a John Conco Way, or a Henry C., and these are all brilliant, brilliant people. Ayala's brilliant people, okay? No matter how brilliant these people are, no matter how brilliant these people are, the world changes and their words will no longer work. What God teaches is eternal. 
what God teaches is timeless. There never will be a season where the living word of God, where the wisdom of God is not applicable. See, that's the difference between God's word and every, any other book you'd ever read in your life. Now, I've always been a voracious reader, but you know what? I can think of books that I read that I thought were really, really cool 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. But you know what? In the world today, what they teach doesn't work. But God's word is living. The wisdom of God never comes to a place where it ends, where it comes to nothing. All right, so we, we don't speak the wisdom of this age in God's house because it won't bring anybody to God. We, we don't speak the wisdom of the great influencers of this age because they come to nothing. And thirdly, we don't speak the religious wisdom of this age. Now, this is something Paul had to bring out to the church in Colossae. Colossae has what theologians call the Colossian heresy, and there's a lot of stuff mixed up in this Colossian heresy. But part of it was that ancient philosophy of asceticism, that ancient philosophy of, of, uh, of denying the self and of putting down the human body that we've talked about so much lately. And Paul writes in Colossians 2, verse 23, such regulations indeed have the appearance of wisdom. You know, poverty has an appearance of wisdom in an affluent society, okay? Yes, simple life, doing with more, has the appearance of wisdom. Such regulations indeed have the appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, their harsh treatment of the body. But they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. You know, people think, if I will just give up everything I have in life, I'll never be challenged with the love of money. You know what? I found more poor people dealing with a love of money and more poor people dealing with greed and selfishness in life than rich people. For one thing, there's more of them. But just be, whether you have something or you don't have something, doesn't change temptation. Temptation will still be there. It may manifest in different forms. But poor people suffer envy. Poor people have the love of money. See, this, this harsh treatment of the body, this false humility, it, it, all of this has the appearance of wisdom, but it lacks any value in restraining sensual indulgence. I once asked a very famous man, he was a businessman, I said, how much is too much? When it comes as a Christian, because you're a Christian businessman, how much is too much? And he made this statement. He said, the question is not how much money do you make? He said, the question is how much money do you give away? Ah, oh, yeah, generosity. Generosity, God's wisdom for greed and the love of money is generosity. Ah, oh, like an epiphany moment for me. So, all right, God, make me rich. Give me as much as you ever want to give me, Lord, and I'll give it away. I like what my uncle Lester said. He said, if I die with $2,000 cash in the bank, I've died a traitor to the cause. And those of you who know Sister Bev and I well, you know that we've spent a lifetime giving everything away. Now, yes, we have a beautiful home now. I wanted to make sure that if anything ever happened to me, Sister Bev is taken care of and my, I leave an inheritance for my children's children. But Sister Bev and I spent a lifetime giving money away. Now, businessmen, it's not a question of how much you make. Don't, don't ever be concerned about that. It's a question of your generosity. See, restraining yourself and saying, no, I'm not going to make any more money. Putting these harsh things on your life, wanting to, to live in poverty, lacks any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Ah, but there is a solution. Have you ever noticed God's not greedy? God's not envious? And God owns the earth and the fullness thereof. The silver and the gold are his. But what is he always doing? Giving it 
away. Ah, yeah. See, folks, the wisdom of this world and the, th and the rules of this world, having all these little rules, has the appearance of wisdom, but it lacks any value in restraining sin. So, all right, we're not looking to the world for wisdom. We're not looking to teach it in God's house because it won't give anybody the knowledge of God. We're not looking to speak it because, forgive me, it is, it's on a time clock, okay? The, 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 the wisdom of the rulers of this earth will come to an end, okay? And it lacks any value in, in overcoming sin. So what is the true source of wisdom that you and I are to teach? And this will take several weeks to get through. First of all, we speak a wisdom of God that is secret. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. We've talked about that. No, we speak God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. God's wisdom is hidden. God's wisdom comes from heaven. James chapter 3, verse 17. But the wisdom that comes from heaven, or so there is a wisdom that is hidden, and that wisdom is hidden in heaven. And that wisdom that is hidden in heaven has some characteristics about it that will allow us to comprehend it and will allow us to know, yes, now this is the right source of wisdom. You say, well, how do you do that? God's great how-tos, God's great applications of facts, God's great assimilation and integration of truth into our lives has some characteristics. When God begins to teach us how to, these are the characteristics you look for. James 3, 17. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. So, okay. When God teaches you how to, it's pure. There's no corruption in it. If you wonder, is this how God is teaching me to do something? Ask yourself the question, is this pure? There's no sin involved. Secondly, God's wisdom is peace loving. Not peacekeeping, but peace loving. When God shows you how to do something, it doesn't involve going around stirring up strife all over the place, okay? It's, it's peace-loving. Thirdly, God's wisdom is considerate. It, it doesn't mock people. God's wisdom doesn't go around putting other people down. God's wisdom is considerate. Next one, God's wisdom is submissive. There's no rebelliousness in God's wisdom. If God is teaching you how to do something, there will be no rebellion in it. There will be no anarchy in it. There will be no fighting against authority in it. God's wisdom is full of mercy. Wow, I like that. The wisdom of God, knowing how to do something, is always full of mercy. It's not destructive. It doesn't go out and destroy anybody. God's wisdom is merciful. God's wisdom is full of good fruit. Wow. <laughs> now, now, there's a big one to look for. Do, do you see fruit being born? And not just a little fruit. The wisdom of this world will bear fruit, but God's wisdom is full of good fruit. Now, there's a difference there. The wisdom of this world will have some accomplishment, but the wisdom of God will be full, puspos, of good fruit. And the next one, God's wisdom is impartial. God's wisdom doesn't show favoritism. And the last one is God's wisdom is sincere. There's sincerity there. there, there there's, there there's not a lack of, there's not, there's not deceit. There, there's not lying. There's no deceit and lying involved in it. There's no twisting of the words and twisting of truth. Well, you know, I can get them to do what I want if I twist this just a little bit. Okay, you do that, but that's not God's wisdom. That might be the wisdom of the world, but it's not God's wisdom. So go back and look at this and go, okay, if I want God's wisdom, it's hidden. And we'll see how to unlock that wisdom by revelation, maybe tomorrow night. It comes by revelation of the Spirit. 
But when God begins to teach you how to do something, that wisdom will flow from heaven. And you can judge it. You can judge. All right, God's how-to will be pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, full of good fruit, and impartial and sincere. Now, now that's just that's just beautiful, all right? Now, the purpose of God's wisdom. And now this one's going to mess you up a little bit. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. Not for his glory, for our glory. See, the Greek word here for glory means glory, splendor, or fame. The wisdom that has been hidden and God destined for our splendor, for our fame, for our glory. This, now hold steady with me, this is how God promotes you. God promotes you by wisdom. You think different than everybody else. God's wisdom makes you stand out. God's hidden wisdom, when it's imparted to you by revelation, this is how to do this. God's wisdom makes you stand out. You're not just part of this big blob of humanity doing everything the way the world does it. You, you, you stand out. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Now tie Daniel 12, 3 with Philippians 2, 12. So that you may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. Those who are wise, Daniel 12, 3 will shine like the brightness of the heavens. The wisdom of God makes your life illuminated in this world. The wisdom of God is destined for your fame, for your splendor, for your glory. Now just begin to think about that for a while. As long as you do things the way everybody else does things, nobody notices you. But when God shows you how to do something, when God imparts wisdom to you, not just facts, knowledge is facts, but when God imparts his hidden wisdom and shows you how to do something, now all of a sudden you stand out in a crowd. Now all of a sudden fame comes to your life. Now all of a sudden splendor comes to your life. Now all of a sudden the wise shine like the brightness of the heavens. Now, now, some of you, forgive me, career people, you really need to listen to me on this. God has called you to be a professional. There are people God calls to be entrepreneurs and businessmen, but there are also people that God calls to be professionals. Now, you can fit into this faceless mass of humanity of other professionals around you, or you can wait on God and say, Lord, can you show me your wisdom. How would you do this? How would you think about this? I remember T.L. and Daisy Osborne. Now, these are some of the greatest apostles that have ever lived. And after Paul, maybe a man who's led more people to Christ than anybody else. But when you got around T.L. and Daisy Osborne, and, and Cho is the same way, well, when you, when you get around people like this, they just think differently than everybody else. You know, I, I, I say very little and I talk very little when I'm with somebody like a T.L. Osborne or a Daisy Osborne or a Young Geet Show. I, I talk very little around people like this. And, and you say, well, Pastor Summer, you, you should speak more so that they will recognize you. No, 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 I want to listen more. These people think differently than everybody else. These are men and women of God who have learned how to tap into that hidden wisdom from heaven. And now they shine like the brightness of the stars of heaven because of the wisdom. Now, you, you want to know what will make you stand out. It's not thinking like everybody else. It's not being like everybody else. It's not dressing like everybody else. It's coming into the presence of God 
and allowing the Holy Spirit to take facts and show you how God would apply that. You sit down and you spend time in the Word and, and you see things. Wow, God thinks about situations like this completely differently. Wow, God would do something very differently in this than, than ever been done before. Wow. And you begin to spend time in the Word and time in prayer. And the Holy Spirit begins to show you a different system of logic, a different way of thinking, a different way of applying those facts. And all of a sudden, fame comes to your life. All of a sudden, you're recognized. All of a sudden, your name begins to be a name that is known in the earth. But it was not because you acted like everybody else. It's because you recognize that there's a hidden wisdom of God, a way to look at things, a way to apply facts, a, a way to do things that, forgive me, doesn't come from the God of this world. Now, there's another purpose. I told you that would blow you away. This one we understand a little better. Ephesians 3, verse 10. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. New Living Translations. God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety. God's wisdom has a rich variety. It's not just one little piece. To all the unseen rulers and authority in the heavenly realms. Now, now just sit down and think about that for just a few minutes. Just sit down and think about that for a few minutes. God in the church reveals to all the angels and to all the fallen angels that we call demons, all the unseen rulers and authorities in heavenly realms, his wisdom. <laughs> he does that in the church. He shows the unseen rulers, the, the, the spiritual authorities of this world, the angels and the demons. He, he shows them the wisdom of forgiveness, <laughs> the wisdom of justification, the wisdom of the sacrifice of the Son of God, the wisdom of the sacrifice of life, the wisdom of lose your life and you shall gain it. Ah, the wisdom of giving it all away and God, trusting God to provide. The wisdom. <laughs> and you just sit back and you go, so God is still educating the demons today and God is still educating the angels today of his incredible eternal wisdom. And he does it by letting the angels and the demons see what he's doing in the church. Wow. Now just sit back and wrap your brain around that for just a little bit. Now let me give you one last thought before we close. What does it take to understand God's wisdom? Well, it's only given to those who are born again. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 7. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory. He's speaking to believers before time began. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, however, as it is written, no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Romans 8, 28, we know that in all things, God works together for good for those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 3, again, one of Paul's favorite phrases, but the man who loves God is known by God. So God has only given it to people who are born again, those who love him. And it is only revealed by the Spirit to spiritual people. And we're going to get into this over the next few nights. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10 to 12. But God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. God reveals his wisdom to his people by his Spirit. Let me say that again. God reveals his wisdom to his people by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. For we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit of who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given to us. Now just think how differently Jesus thought. A woman is caught in the very act of adultery. 
Their religious wisdom said, stone her. God's wisdom said, go and sin no more. God's wisdom diffused the situation by saying, he who is without sin, throw the first stone. And the oldest were the first to leave. Not the youngest, the oldest were the first to leave. They understood a little bit better. Think about the wisdom that God spoke to Paul. People poisoned the minds of people against Paul so that he would leave the city. and People wouldn't listen to him. God's wisdom was, Paul, stay there a long time and bear fruit. Let's see miracles. Let's, let's see significant accomplishment. And we're going to get the poison out of people's minds. You, you look at the wisdom that God gave to Paul in leading the church. You look at the wisdom God gave Jesus, his son, as he birthed the church. My goodness, it's just pick up here tomorrow night. But my goodness, beloved, there is a hidden wisdom. But you and I have to be willing. And please hear me on this. You and I have to be willing to not do things the way everybody else is doing them. We have to be willing to be unique enough to come before God and sit in his word, read his word and pray and ask the Holy Spirit, okay, this is my situation. These are the facts. Now, what do I do with these facts? And God has a wisdom that will make you stand out and shine like the stars. Amen. All right, we're going to stop there tonight. Tomorrow night, we're going to get into revelation more and the, the revelation of the Spirit. But you just need to get a hold of this last part really, really strong. As a believer, you can tap into God's wisdom. You, you don't have to be like the mindless masses of this world. We're, not, we're in this world, but we're not of this world. Not only does our provision come from heaven, but our wisdom comes from heaven. All right, we'll see you tomorrow morning, 5.45 for Daniel's prayer. Then morning devotion starts at 6. We'll see you then. Thank you for going online for tonight's evening service. We hope that you will join Pastors David and Beverly Somerville of the Cathedral of Praise Manila again tomorrow at 7 p.m. You may also join our daily devotions with Pastor David E. Somerville every Monday to Saturday at 6 a.m. Our drive-in service is available for booking and happens every Saturday at 7.30 a.m. and Sunday at 7.30 a.m. and 9.30 a.m. For more information and updates, visit us on facebook.com slash cop.manila.